Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Before I read, would you greet a couple people, bless them, and remind them that they are blessed to be in this free country. Welcome to God's house today as you get back to your spot. I know you're ready to sit down. We're going to read God's word in a moment, but what a blessing it is to be able to worship the Lord freely. This, just yesterday, our missions team was meeting, and as we were meeting, we got a message from India, one of the organizations we support, and they were letting us know that the churches in India are being attacked, pastors being beaten, churches being attacked. And yet here we are blessed to be able to worship the Lord freely. It is a blessing, but at the same time, I hope we remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in other places that are not sharing the same freedom we have. Yet we can all still together stand and say, it is for freedom that Christ has indeed set us free. So our true freedom comes from Jesus. And if you believe that, I hope you can give God honor and glory for that. But today, let me begin with reading Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, God's word says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Would you join me in prayer today as we seek to discover God's truth together? Father, in your holy and precious name, we pray. We pray because we know you are powerful. We pray because we know, we know that you love us. And today as we gather here to bless your name and to worship you, we are blessed just to be in your presence. We are blessed to be able to come and freely worship the name above all names. And God, we give you glory for that. And I pray, I pray that as we stand here before you today, that as we get ready to study your word, that we would be encouraged today. We would be equipped and prepared to see all that you have in a store for us, to see that our God is a consuming fire, to see that our God is a God who fights for us, to see that our God has won every battle, to see that our God stands mighty and glorious. And your name is Jesus. And because of your blood, today we stand free free from sin, free from condemnation. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise that we get to serve you and to worship you in this house today. May the words we read penetrate deep into our hearts today. This is your church. We are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture. Please lead us to green pastures today, Lord. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. 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 Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Hey, happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you guys. I'm so glad you are here. If you have your Bibles, would you please open up to the book of Genesis chapter 14. We're going to continue where we left off last week. If you're using your digital devices, please make sure you silence them. And if you do need a Bible, there is some in the back. You can go grab them or keep your hands up. Let our ushers see you to bring you a copy. Now, if you were here with us last week, I told you, I said, please read Genesis chapter 14 to be prepared for today. How many of you have actually read Genesis chapter 14 to be prepared? Yeah. My goodness, good. I, I, like, I like it. I like that you are prepared. For some of you, I'm proud of you for doing that. If you haven't read it, it's not a big deal, okay? We're going to go through it together. But if you read it, you know, or you understand what I'm about to tell you, I dreaded this chapter. I dreaded preaching this, not because there is theological issues in there that I am afraid to talk about, not because there's social things in it that I'm afraid to talk about. I dreaded it because I, in my futile way of thinking, I thought to myself, there isn't much in this chapter other than the ending parts that I can really preach about. And I knew that the Lord didn't want me to really talk about Melchizedek, the name that you see in the Bible, in the, in the last portions of the passage. I knew the Lord didn't want me to talk about Melchizedek because I preached a sermon a few years back on the whole, whole idea of Melchizedek. So if you want to hear about that, 
Send me an email. I'll send you the link to that. But I knew that God really wanted me to focus on the first portions of this and tie it to what God has for us. And I didn't really like it. So I thought to myself, what is there in here that I can even talk about? So I sought the Lord. And as I was seeking the Lord, God really led me to a passage that we talk quite a bit about. If you have ever been to discipleship class, we cover this quite a bit. And we talk about this quite a bit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All the scripture is breathed out by God, meaning every bit of it is God's breath. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Here's what it means. It means every bit of the Scripture is God's breath. Every bit of this book is profitable for teaching, for training, for equipping people. Every bit of it is to complete us into understanding who God is. But most importantly, every bit of this book is to remind us that God is fighting for us. Every bit of it. So I want to begin with this question for today. If you're a note taker, ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, do I genuinely believe that God is fighting for me? Do I genuinely believe that God is fighting for me? Do you really believe that God really wants you? He's fighting for you. He's trying to save you. He's trying to protect you. He's trying to keep you from the hazards and the harms that you're going to bring upon yourself. Do you genuinely believe that? And as, as you ask yourself really that, um, you know, before we jump into Genesis 14, there's this passage in 2 Kings chapter 6. There's the story of the king of Syria who is really mad at the prophet of God, Elisha, and he wants to kill him. So he sends this massive army. He sends this massive army to come capture and kill Elisha. And as this, the, the army comes surrounds the city, the servant of Elisha tells him, hey, uh, we are surrounded by this army. And Elisha says, don't worry. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. And, and Elisha prays in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Elisha places, then, then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around them. As his eyes opened, he saw that God is fighting the battle. So here's the thing. I, I, want, I want you to do yourself a favor today. Would you do yourself this favor? Would you raise your hands toward heaven real quick? We're going to pray this prayer together. It's a sentence prayer. We can do this. Every one of you, please say this, okay? Say, God, would you please open my eyes so I can see? Amen. Amen. Now we're going to see God speak to us through His Word to see that He is fighting every battle for us. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody excited about God's Word in this house? Yeah. All right. Man, I like it. I like this rowdy group. I like it. Now keep your enthusiasm. So last week we looked at Genesis chapter 13 and 12 and 13. And, and we talked about how Abraham, when he got worried, he made bad decisions. But we looked at some remedies for worry. And we saw that God three times told Abraham, he said, I will give this land to your descendants. And I, I'll also bless all the earth from your descendants. And we looked at that. Now we're going to continue in the story. We saw that Lot and Abraham got separated because the land could not sustain all of their animals and everything that they had. So now here's where we continue. You, chapter 14 verse 1 is building us up for what is to come and you're going to have to pray for me because I'm going to pronounce some names okay in the days of our Mephael king of Shinar Ariok king of Elisar Kedar Omar, king of Elam and Tidal king of Goim these kings made war with Bera king of Sodom Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shonab king of Adma, Shemaber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedal Omar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, uh, let me pause actually right here. So for twelve years, five kings had served Kedar Omar, who was also having other three kings follow him. For five years they had served him. By the way, this is the first recorded war in the Bible. Okay? So there is this guy whose name is mentioned, Kedar Omar, who seems to be a mighty man. And here's the important thing about this guy. There are three other kings who follow him. His very name strikes fear in the hearts of people who hear it. His name can literally translate to this. I'm going to have this on the screen. His name can literally translate to servant of Lagimar, the Elamite goddess of the underworld. So his very name implies that wherever this dude goes, death and Hades follow. 
Wherever this guy goes, underworld is following. Death is following. His very name is scary. This is a mighty man who is about to go to war with five kings who have been serving him, and now they have rebelled against him. You still with me? Story, story is building us up, preparing us for something to come. Verse 5, it says, In the 14th year, Kedar Omar and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim. Let me pause and keep the verse on the screen for a moment. The Rephaim. Now we, we introduced, we, we encountered this word, Rephaim, in Genesis chapter 6. The word literally can translate to two things, giants or strongs. And notice that the first attack that this Kedar Omar with his army makes is to giants, people who are known to be mighty and strong. Okay, so he defeats them. Now let's continue. He attacks the Rephaim, defeated them in Ashroth Karanaim, then the, the Zuzem in Ham, the Emim in Shavakarathaim, the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpath, that is Kadash, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. Now here's what's going on. Before this dude, who is, whose name means the servant of the goddess of the underworld. Before this guy goes to the main war that he's supposed to fight with those who have, who have rebelled against him, the five kingdoms, he goes and defeats five other kingdoms. He goes and defeats five other groups of people just to set the story for you to know how strong this guy is. How his armies are powerful. How powerful this guy is so that you would begin to tremble before you would go to war with this guy. Now, we're not done yet. Are you with me? Verse 8, then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Ze Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim. With Kedal Omar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, and Maphael, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen. It could mean in your translations asphalt pits or tar pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them. And the rest fled to the hill country. Now here's an important thing coming, verse 11. So the, help me out with this word. So the enemy, so the enemy, hold on to that word. So the enemy took all the positions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provision and went their way. They also took Lot. They took who? Lot, son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his positions, and went their way. Now, let me, let me, let me, in case you didn't understand what happened here, let me correct a few things, or not correct, let me reinstate a few things. These four kings set out to go to war with the five kings, but before they actually go into war, Kedar Omar and his army defeat the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emim, the Horites, and all the country of the Amalekites. He defeats all of those guys, okay? Before he goes to the main war, then he goes to the main war with the five kings who have rebelled against him. Not only does he defeat them, they run away scattered. And as they run away scattered, here's the crazy thing happens. They are running for their lives. Now, the Bible gives you two clues, though, about all the story. Twelve verses, mentioned, 12 verses dedicated to this guy, Kedar Omar. And you have to say why. But the Bible gives you two clues. In the next slide, if you go on it, verse 11, it says that God saw, in verse 11, look at verse 11. It says that God saw him as what? The enemy. The enemy. God's word sees and describes this man as the enemy. Now, the first clue is that God sees him as enemy. The second thing that happens in the story is that this dude, Kedar Omar, makes the biggest mistake in his life. He captures Lot, the nephew of God's chosen man, the one whom God has promised the land to, the one that faithfully serves the God, the, the, God, the one who, who faithfully loves God, the one who is important to God, the one whom God loves. He makes the mistake of capturing one who belongs to the man of God. Now here's the thing. That's where the enemy makes the biggest mistake when he tries to mess with God's people. So if you're a note taker, i got three lessons for us today. Lesson number one. Write this down. God's people are not intimidated by the appearing might of the enemy. Listen, if you're a follower of Christ, the enemy may appear as a servant of the goddess of death. The enemy may appear with ma massive armies and large armies come before you, but if you are a follower of Christ, you are not as scared of what the enemy is doing. You are not scared of the powers of, of the enemy because Proverbs 29 verse 25, it says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever does what? Trust in the Lord is what? Safe. 
Psalm chapter 56, verses 3 and 4, it says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Here's the thing. God's people are not intimidated by the powers of the enemy. That's why for centuries we have seen that Christians can be threatened to be killed. They can have a gun held on their head. They can be threatened to be destroyed and, and, and their families be destroyed. But yet they still can stand in the glory of God and shout, say, I believe in the name of Jesus and nothing can stop that. That's why we can see Christians can be threatened, can be hurt, they can be, they can be shot, but they can still shout out and say, Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Why? Because we are not intimidated by the powers of the enemy. You can try to hurt us. You can try to scare us. But we believe that our enemy stands defeated. Now, you still with me? Yeah. Now, 12 verses dedicated to tell you how mighty Kedar Omar is. Then you get to verse 13. It says, Then one who had escaped, it took one person to escape, and came and told Abram, the Hebrew, this is the first time you see the word Hebrew in the Bible, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram, and when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth, watch this, his trained men born in his house, three million. Uh, I want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> he took his trained men, 300,000. No? Oh, good, you're paying attention. 318 of them. This is written so you would laugh. So, are you kidding me, right? 318 of them. And he went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants, help me out with this word, and defeated, defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the positions, all the positions, and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his positions and the women and the people. Now, in case you did not see everything here, let me clarify a few things for all of us. So Abraham goes, he hears that his nephew is taken. He gathers his 318 men, which sounds ridiculous, and he goes in pursuit of the guy, Kedar Omar, who has three other kings who are serving him, who has just gone to war with, with ten other nations and kingdoms, and he has defeated the Raphaim, the Emim, the, the Zumzim, the Horites, the country of the Amalekites, king of Sodom, king of Gomorrah, king of Adma, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela. He has just defeated ten kingdoms, and he goes, and the scripture does not have a single record, record of even a single casualty. When Abraham comes back, this raises a challenge for scholars. Because a lot of scholars say, well, how can this be possible? Those who study the Bible say, hold on a second, that's impossible. How could this be possible? So a lot of the people who pour their, their, their time into scholarly understanding of the Bible say, well, this number cannot be a literal number. It's allegorical. But they do the same thing with the days of creation. God couldn't possibly create the earth in one day. God couldn't possibly create everything in seven days. I've told you this before. You're going to hear me say this again and again and again until hopefully it sinks in. I have the tendency to take God's word literal until you can prove it to me otherwise. And I believe when God's word says that Abraham took 318 men, he really did take 318 men because here's the lesson number two that I want you to write down if you're a note, note taker. God's people do not fight God's people fight with divine powers that defy human reality. We do not fight with human powers. We fight with divine powers that human understanding cannot explain. We are fighting with God's power. We are fighting with God's spirit within us. We are fighting with the God who has resurrected the powers, who has resurrected over the powers of hell and death. That's the kind of a God that we are serving. And if you forget that, then you bring death and destruction upon yourself. That's why so many of us are stuck. But let me, let me remind you of something. This book... This book is filled with stories of war. So many of them that wars that have been defeated by the power of God. Let me give you a few of them and see if they make sense, okay? For example, it says in, in Joshua chapter 5 and 6, it says that the Israelites were told by God to walk around the walls of Jericho. And on the seventh day, the whole wall co collapsed. Let me ask you this. Does that even make sense? <laughs> Judges chapter 7 tells us that God, God defeated the Midianites through Gideon with 300 men, a massive army with 300 men. Let me to ask you this. Does that make even sense, any sense? It tells us in 2 Kings chapter 19, tells us that the angel of the Lord struck down 187,000 Assyrian soldiers. 
And the Israelites didn't even fight. Now that defies human understanding. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it tells us that God turned the Moabites and the Ammonites against each other, that they killed one another, and the Israelites didn't even have to pull their swords out. And it says in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 17, it says, You will not need to fight this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Don't even worry about it. Because that is the kind of a God that we serve. He can fight every battle, and He still wins every battle. That's how powerful He is. The reason why so many of us are stuck where we are. The reason why so many of us are still broken. The reason why so many of us are, are still dealing with marital problems, relational problems, addiction problems. is because somewhere along the line we forgot that we are not supposed to fight with human forces. We are supposed to fight with the Spirit of a mighty God who through us can overcome every power of hell and the enemy. That is the kind of a God that we are serving. So maybe instead we got to start fighting with His power within us. we got to start believing, yes, I can overcome addiction because God is going to overcome it in me. Yes, I can overcome my marital problems, my financial problems because He's going to do it through me. Oh my goodness, are you still with me? Yeah. All right. Listen, lesson number three if you're note takers. Lesson number three. God's people possess God's victory even while the battle is raging. Now, this is important because I want you to see this in this portion as we study it. If you're a person of God, if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God has already won the battle. Now, listen, you may be dealing with your problems, with your addictions, with your crises that are going on, whatever life is throwing at you. You may be fighting for, through all of those kind of things, but God has already won even though we are in the middle of the battle and the fight. He's, he's already won. Now, verse 17 it says, after his return from the, help me out with this, verse 17, if you have your Bibles, okay, verse 17, after his return from the what? Defeat, Defeat of Kedar Omer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavu, that is the king's valley. Let me pause here for a moment. After he defeated this dude who was the servant of the goddess of the underworld, and the other kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, by the way, we know in verse 2 that his name is Bera. Now, don't look at your notes because, I, okay, yeah, just stay with me. Stay with me for a moment. The king of Sodom comes greets him. Now, perhaps his jaws are on the ground. We, we just went to war with this guy. We ran, and some of us fell into the, the tar pits. How did you do this? So some people say, why would he come? Now, we're going to get to that. Then it says in verse Verse 18, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Let me pause right here for a moment. This is the first time we hear this name in the Bible, Melchizedek. Then for another thousand years, there's no mention of him until we get to the book of Psalms. Then for another few thousand years, there's no mention of him until we get to the book of Hebrews. And today, my, I don't have the time to tell you all about him. That's why I told you, if you want to know more about him, I did preach a sermon on this. Send me an email. I'll send you the link. But Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out important detail. What did he bring? Bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, I want you to make sure you see this. And blessed be God Most High, who has done what? Delivered your enemies into your hand, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Here's what happened. Blessed be God who fought the battle, you thought you fought it with the 318 men. But God delivered them into your hands. And I tell you the same thing. That's why God's powers defy human understanding. And what is amazing in the story is that, so now at this point, remember, Kedar Omar had gone into war. He had defeated these 10 kings or 10 groups of people, has defeated all of them. And, and at that time, they would take the plunder. They would take everything. He kidnaps not only Lot and his family and everything that he had, but he has taken all this plunder, and Abraham goes and defeats him. What that means is he actually takes all the plunder that Kedar Omar had gathered and brings it with, three, with his 318 men. And then he comes and gives a tenth of it, a tithe, to Melchizedek. Now, there's a lot of theories on Melchizedek. People say Melchizedek is maybe Jesus himself, is an angel of the Lord. Whatever your theory is, it doesn't matter. What you need to know is a foreshadow of Christ, a type of what Jesus looks like. He greets, Jesus, he greets Abraham as Jesus greets us with wine and bread. Important. We're going to come back to that in a moment too. 
Well, look at verse 21. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. Now, this is interesting to me because it's as though the king of Sodom owns them. Did you notice that? You can keep everything that was mine. No, Abraham just won all of that. He already took all of that. He already won the battle. Remember, king of Sodom, you didn't win the battle. Verse 22, but Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread of your sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but that the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anner, Ashkel, and Mamre take their share. Here's what he says. I will take the wine and the bread. I will take the bread and wine, but I don't want to have anything to do that has your name attached to it. Now, why is that? This one is a bit puzzling because first, first thing that you got to notice is why is that these two kings come visit Abraham as soon as he's defeated Kedalo Omer? Why these two? I think there's more to it. Don't look at your notes yet, okay? Don't look at your notes. Don't cheat. <laughs> but let's talk about who Melchizedek, what Melchizedek's name really means real quick. That the Mal word Melchizedek the w comes from two Hebrew words, Melek Zedek, which literally come put together means the king of righteousness. Now, he's a real person. He's a real person, real historical figure. We don't know much about him, but his name literally means king of righteousness. And he's the king of a place called Salem, which if you look at the definition of the word Salem, means at peace or peaceful. So here's a guy whose name is king of righteousness, and his kingdom is a place called the place of peace, at peace. Now, before, without you looking at your notes and cheating, does anybody know what Sodom means? And this is an interesting one. Sodom literally can translate to flaming or burning. So here's a king of fire king of a place that is burning. And verse 2 tells us that his name is Bera. Now, if you translate the word Bera, Bera literally means son of evil. Interesting. As soon as Abraham defeats the main enemy, Kedal Omer, he is greeted by two kings, king of Sodom, now, some say, well, he was afraid because he had just defeated Kedal Omar and Lot lived in his land. Well, that's a good theory, but I think there's more to it. He's, defeated, he, he's greeted by Melchizedek, prince of righteousness, king of righteousness, the, the king of a place called peace, and he's greeted by a king who is a son of evil, and his kingdom is a flaming, burning place. Now, here's the thing. I believe that every time you and I win a simple battle, Maybe a, not a simple one, maybe a strong one. Every time we win a battle, we are always greeted by two kings. One is the king of righteousness. The other one is a son of evil. And one comes and greets you with wine and bread, which is a symbol of salvation, forgiveness, victory. While the other one comes and says, I know you just won the battle and you won all of that and you took all the plunder, but if you want, I will give you what's already yours. That's what he does. Now, here's the thing. For some of you, maybe just getting to church today was a victory. Maybe all week throughout the week, you had so many things going on in your life, and you made it here. Say, God, thank you. I made it to church to worship you. And you are greeted with the same two kings. One is telling you, God will pay for your sins. The other one will tell you, do you want all the wealth that you already have? Maybe for some of you, you have had a week and, and you have been dealing with so much chaos and craziness, and yet you got the chance to still say, I'm still going to worship the Lord. I'm still going to praise His name. I'm still going to spend time with the Lord. You have had that victory, and then you are greeted with the kings. One is telling you, I have bread and wine for you. That's all you need. The other one tells you, I have wealth and positions that you can acquire. And the question is, which path do you take? Which response do you give? What is your response? Do you believe that God is the one who is fighting your battles? Because if you believe God is the one fighting your battles, you take the bread and the wine, and you say, I don't want to have anything to do with the things that have the name of evil attached to it. But if you thought that you took your 318 men and you fought that battle on your own, then you will say, well, all that plunder is mine. I'm going to have it. Thank you so much. The question is, do you believe that God is the one who is fighting your battles? 
So in a moment, we're going to celebrate communion together. And I, I tell you this because I believe the same King of Righteousness, whose name is Jesus, is standing right here with us. And I believe that the, the evil one is also trying to incite in you to say, you know what, I don't need to follow God. And today you have to figure out what direction you want to go. But as we partake in communion, first let me tell you this. This is for those who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This is for those who say, I want to take the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. I'll take the bread and the wine. And this is a personal request I have from you. Would you hold on to your cups and not throw them away so quick? Don't make noise yet. This cup that you're holding in your hands should be a reminder of God's wrath that is poured on Jesus. It's a reminder of God's victory over death and hell. So don't be so quick to discard it. But the scripture tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned, the scripture says that God gave this promise to woman, said, from your offspring will come this child and he will crush the head of the serpent. Anybody remember that? Now, if you're quiet for a moment, you notice when I break this bread, listen to this sound. Do you hear it? That is the head of the enemy being crushed under the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The head of the serpent. So as you take a piece of that bread and you chew it in a moment, that sound of crushing in your mouth, that is the head of the enemy being crushed under the feet of your Savior. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you believe in him, that he's fighting the battle for you, take, eat, and remember him. The scripture also says that he took the cup. Now we know from the scripture that the wages of sin is death. That means every time you and I choose to sin, we choose to go to war with God who never loses a battle. And seeing our condition, Christ says, I will die on the cross and I will let my blood be shed for their forgiveness so that because of me, they would have life. War demands violence. War demands blood. And when you take this cup, this means that you believe and acknowledge the fact that Jesus' blood is the blood that was poured in this war because those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. So it says in the same way, he also took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you believe in Jesus, take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If he is dead, how is he coming? That means he has overcome the powers of death. So as we finish today, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Thanks be to God, who is always leading those who belong to Him in triumphal procession, meaning it doesn't matter what your week is about to hold. You may be in the middle of a battle. You may be going through war and chaos, but you serve the God, if you call upon His name, who has already won the battle, whose powers defy human reality, whose strength is beyond comprehension. You serve a God who is mighty in everything that He does. He is the King of kings. He is the God of gods. His name is Jesus. And the Scripture says all the gods of the earth are worthless idols, but He alone. None can compare to Him. And if you believe in Him, you are safe. So as I pray, our prayer warriors scheduled for this service are going to come forward. I encourage you, maybe you're in a place in your life, you say, you know what, I am struggling right now. I am fighting a battle, and I just need somebody to pray for me. Come pray with them. Maybe you'd say, you know what, I just need somebody to give me a hug, to remind me that I am not alone in this battle. Come pray with somebody. 
Maybe your life is great and you see that God has already delivered your enemy to you. As Melchizedek said to Abraham, he said, Blessed be God, the, cre the, the God of heaven and the earth who has delivered your enemy into your hand if your enemy is already in your hand and you have, if you're enjoying the plunder of the enemy. Give God praise. Spend a few moments telling God that you're grateful for what He has done for you. If the Spirit of the Lord leads you to kneel before Him, kneel before the King. If He leads you to bow your heads or raise your hands, spend some time in His presence. Jesus, we worship Your holy and magnificent name. We praise You for the amazing God that You are. Lord, we praise You that all the gods of this world are worthless idols. None of them are real but You, Jesus. You are the God of gods. Scripture calls you the Elohim of Elohims. Your name is Jesus. You are the Savior. You are the Redeemer. You are the one who gives hope. Lord, we pray today that you would fill every heart in this place with your hope. You would fill every mind with grace and mercy. That you would remind us, as your word tells us, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, that we would walk out of here with the victory of Christ. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession. Lord, we give you praise for that. And as we walk out of these doors, may we remember that as you lead us in victory, you also allow us to be the fragrance, aroma of Christ's salvation to those around us. As we step into the battlefield, as we step into the chaos of this world, may we stand in the victory of Jesus and be a proclamation of what it looks like to serve the Lord. Jesus Send us out as your people. Send us out with the wisdom of the Lord on our lips, on our hearts, in our minds. Salvation belongs to you, Jesus. Victory belongs to you. And as the sheep of your pasture, we depend on our shepherd. Lead us, Jesus, in your holy and precious.